leaders. That's it for me, so this has been your Woodland Weekly. It was that silent night when the stars turned their gaze to marvel at the earth. And all was calm, all was bright. Yet could this be the same God of Abraham, the conqueror of Israel? This baby, this fragile life, setting his throne on straw and manger, who reigns victorious, yet bows to serve the broken. He holds this mystery balanced in his hands, holds our questions till they lose their need, until all we see is him. Wasn't that choir awesome? Yeah, they were great. And then we had our elder board uh, do the lighting of the Advent candle. That was a lot of fun as well. They did a great job. When was the last time you experienced peace, ease, tranquility, uh, serenity? When was the last time you experienced anxiety? Stress, pressure, angst, fear. Did you know that 30% uh, of adults at some point in their life will experience a season of anxiety, an anxiety disorder? 30%. And lots of times uh, that's caused by a chemical imbalance in the brain that is treated oftentimes with, with medicine. But for the rest of us who don't have a chemical imbalance in the brain, anxiety is caused by trying to be in control or thinking we are in control of things that are outside of our control. Anxiety is caused by thinking that we are atlas, carrying the weight of the world on our shoulders, and it will crush us. You probably know by now that anxiety and peace cannot coexist. They're like the two family members you invite to the Christmas party who can't stand each other, and so they stay uh, one at the hors d'oeuvres and one at the dessert table the whole night. That's, that's how anxiety and peace are. They can't survive together. So the question I want us to wrestle with today is how in the world do we get past anxiety to experience peace? And the answer is rather simple. It, it's not rocket science, or in this case, brain science. In fact, it's all over the pages of Scripture. The simple answer to help us move from anxiety to peace is all over the biblical story. But since it's Christmas time, we're going to look at the story of Mary. Just before she gets pregnant with peace on earth, Jesus Christ. So if you have your Bibles, I'm going to read Luke chapter 1. Verses 26 to 38. I want you to listen for Mary's anxiety and then her peace. Luke 1, 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. 
Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. Anxiety comes according to Mary, from being highly favored. Mary is greatly troubled by being highly favored by God. It seems like an odd response. I mean, look at, look at verse uh, 28 and 29 again of that passage. The angel says to Mary, greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you, which sounds like really good news. And then Mary's response is that she is troubled, greatly troubled, why is that? It seems like an incongruent response to what the angel said. Mary is a, is a good Jewish girl who knows the Old Testament stories backward and forward. She knows that with the favor of God often comes a mission from God. And that the mission from God is often way too big for the person of God. She knows that. And she's greatly troubled. I mean, Mary is just a small town girl living in a lonely world who's not the type to take the midnight train going anywhere. And if you don't know that reference, you're probably young enough to have Bieber fever or old enough to think that Elvis is still cool. The inconvenience of being highly favored is a big deal for Mary. I mean, the angel tells her she will be pregnant out of wedlock. And Mary knows that soon she will show and look like a hoe. And if you're mad at me for saying that, realize that's exactly how Mary feels. She is a pure, religious Jewish girl, probably age 12 to 14, in a very religious culture. And she knows if she gets pregnant out of wedlock, Joseph will probably call the whole thing off. She'll have a baby. And her chances of finding an honorable man are slim to none. If she has this baby out of wedlock, she will have a scarlet letter on her that leads to her shame and will ruin her chances for marriage and family. She knows it, which is why she takes pride in her virginity. How can this be? I'm a virgin. Maybe the favor of God is not so favorable. <laughs> God did favor Mary. He did. But not in the way we might expect. He favored her by inviting her, a poor peasant girl living in a lonely world, rural Galilee, to be part of something bigger and greater than she could ever imagine. Let's, let's not forget that this, this young girl, again, age 12 to 14, spent most of her days doing mundane household chores. And now she's called by God to deliver peace on earth in the form of a baby. Be warned. <laughs> Look out. When you open up the womb of your heart to the favor of God, he will give you a mission, a next step, a call that is way too big for you. And it will be seemingly uncomfortable and inconvenient in some ways. And that rub will cause some anxiety to well up within you. It, it just will. And I think Mary had some early anxiety in that conversation. Who wouldn't? I'm a recovering Catholic. Any recovering Catholics in the house? I heard Jordan's testimony this morning. He's a recovering Catholic. I'm a recovering Catholic, which means that I, I uh, grew up Catholic and I, I tended to put a supersized halo on Mary, making her like superhuman. She's a great woman, but she's a person. And in that moment, I feel like she had some significant anxiety. And the way that I know it is by the question she asked. She's visited by an angel who says she's favored by God and is called to a special mission from God and the first words out of her mouth are, 
How can this be? I'm a virgin. She's asking how questions. <laughs> how am I able to do this? How can I get this done? How is this going to go down? How will people view me? How will Joseph endure this situation? And maybe you experience anxiety caused by asking how questions too. How can I get everything done on my to-do list? How am I going to get one kid to band practice, one kid to a basketball game, and one kid to a doctor's appointment? How, 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 how am I going to find the time and the energy and the money to do what I need to do when I need to do it? How, how, how? Anxiety, anxiety, anxiety. Well, maybe Mary's struggle is a belief struggle. And that causes anxiety. There's two kinds of belief struggles going on here. It seems like maybe God believes in Mary more than Mary believes in Mary, and maybe more than Mary believes in God. That is, maybe God has more faith in Mary's potential than Mary has in her potential and in the power of God in that moment. I don't know if you've seen this t-shirt. My son has it. Uh, it says, Bigfoot doesn't believe in you either. Have you seen those shirts? My oldest son has that. It's like Bigfoot feels like if you don't believe in him, he's not going to believe in you. God's not like that. Even if you don't believe in you, God believes in you. And even if you don't believe in God, God still believes in your potential. He won't give up on you. He, he won't stop believing. Another journey, illusion. Some of you got that. Belief struggles for Mary are these. So, so God believes in Mary more than Mary believes in Mary, which is why he calls this young girl to a monumental, missional opportunity to be the mother of God. And she's thrown by it. She's thinking, maybe you have the wrong person. How can this be? I'm a virgin. Look somewhere else. God believes in Mary more than Mary believes in Mary, so he puts the mantle of the mother of God on her shoulders, and at first it doesn't seem like she wants it or she's ready for it. I mean, who is? And this happens all throughout Scripture, by the way, where the favor of God will come with a mission from God that's way too big for the person but not too big for God, and they will doubt their potential. It happened with Abraham. God said, you will be the father of a nation, and he's like, how? I'm too old. God says to Moses, go and speak to Pharaoh to let my people go, the Hebrews. And Moses says, how? I can't speak. God goes uh, to Jeremiah and says, preach to the people of Israel because they've turned their back on me. Call them back to relationship with me. And Jeremiah's like, how? I'm too young. And now with Mary, you will be the mother of the Most High. How? 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 I'm a virgin. So maybe God believes in Mary more than Mary believes in Mary, and that causes some anxiety for her. But I think what really is at stake here and is causing some anxiety for Mary at first, and would cause anxiety maybe for us, is that maybe Mary is not sure that God can pull it off in that moment. The question that surfaces to cause our anxiety whenever we are favored by God with a mission from God that seems way too big for us is not only can I do it, but is God able? Is God really able to do this thing and is God really with me to get it done? Do we really believe that if God calls us to it, he will see us through it? Do we? Because when the favor of God comes, he will call you to a next step that is bigger than you, more than you want, perhaps inconvenient and uncomfortable, and we will be faced with a choice, will I believe in God or will I not? And I think that's where Mary is. Will God call me to something and then hang me out to dry or bail on me or let me down in some way? Or will the God who called me to it see me through it? Whatever that next step is. Well, the angel, oddly enough, responds to Mary's how question 
with a why answer. How will this be, verse 34, how will this be, Mary asked, since I'm a virgin? And the angel responds not with a how, but with a who. The Holy Spirit will come on you. The presence of God. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. The power of God. So Mary has all these how questions. How can I? How can I? How am I? How will I? And the angel's giving her a who answer. God. The presence of God and the power of God equals peace. Is God able to do it? I think about Peter. Uh, You recall Peter uh, walking out of the boat because he saw Jesus, and Jesus calls him out of the boat onto the water, and Peter begins to walk on water. He's got his eyes fixed on the who, on Jesus. And he's good. He's, He's water walking. He's doing something that's way outside of his league. But then he sees the wind and the wave, and starts to wonder how he can survive the wind and the wave. And he takes his eyes off of the who, Jesus, and puts his eyes on the how. How can I? And he begins to sink. When we focus on how can I and forget the who is God, we will sink in a sea of anxiety every time. But, If we can focus less on the how can I, my savvy, my skill, my presence, my power, and more on the who he is, his presence, his power, then we can experience peace in the midst of all kinds of circumstances. I can be a bit of a Mary, how about you? At least Mary with anxiety before she gets to peace. Um, I feel like, you know, God called me to Woodland and uh, made it really, really clear that this was what he was calling us to. And at that point, I had my eyes on the who. If God calls me to it, he will see me through it. And so I, I ventured to come here, and I started here on February 14th, Valentine's Day. And I got to tell you, as soon as I said yes to the call from God because I was focused on the who, the how questions came. And I had some anxiety. How am I going to find a house in this market? (laughs) How am I going to help my my wife and kids transition to a new place? How am I not only going to love and shepherd Woodland where it is, but lead and stretch Woodland to where it can go? How am I going to call us to give and pray and serve so that we have all that we need to do all that God's called us to do, not just in this building, but in Battle Creek. I mean, what difference can I possibly make? And so when I start to focus on how can I, I get stressed out real quick. Anxiety, anxiety, anxiety. Even when I preach, uh, you know, no matter how long I've preached, I've been preaching since I was in my early 20s, wrote a couple books on preaching, taught preaching, it doesn't matter. Every time I get up here, I feel the weight of my own anxiety. <laughs> and I start wondering, how can my words make a lick of difference? I mean, using, using words from this platform to impact lives is like trying to use a garden hose to put out a thousand acre forest fire, you know? I feel that. And I feel anxiety. How can I? How can I? How can I? and it gets me nowhere. And maybe you are struggling with the how questions, and it's causing you anxiety, because you've taken your eyes off of the who and have put them on the how. Who is God versus how can I? How can I make ends meet? How can I reconcile? How can I save my marriage? How can I raise my kids to love Jesus in a world that is hostile to faith? How can I get sober? How can I get free? How can I? How will I? How am I? It's enough to drive us crazy. And I'm not saying that we don't ever consider the how. I mean, plans fail for lack of planning. I get that. You have a role to play. 
All I'm saying is that when the how question is the first question before the who question, you'll put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. You'll put the pressure on you instead of where it belongs, on God. If God calls you to it, he will, he will see you through it. Do you believe that? Well, I can be a bit of a Mary. Maybe you can be a bit of a Mary. So how, how does Mary move from anxiety to peace? How does she move from a focus on the how can I to the who is he? Mary shows us the way from anxiety to peace. And it's simple. It's so simple. It's not rocket science or brain science. It's simple. She shows us how to get to a place of sweet serenity. At the very end of this passage, after her how questions, really which weren't ever answered, she focuses on the who. She says at the end, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. May it be as you have written. May your word for me come true. Mary shows us that surrender to God leads to serenity from God. Surrender leads to serenity. You want peace? You got peace? Surrender to God leads to serenity from God. If God calls you to it, he will see you through it. Every time in my Christian life, when God was calling me to take a next step of, of mission, service, or faith that seemed way too big, maybe a little bit inconvenient and uncomfortable, and I wrestled with that, and I delayed that, there was anxiety. Because the Holy Spirit was nudging me to take my next step, and I was like this. I wasn't ready, I was resistant, and there was anxiety. Because I had all kinds of how questions. How can I get through that? How can I do that? Every time, though, that by the grace of God, I took that next step, trying my best by his grace to focus less on how can I and more on who he is, every single time there was peace, every single time. Was it hard sometimes? Yep. Was it inconvenient sometimes? Yep. Every time I surrendered my will to the will of God, I found him to be faithful, and there was peace. Serenity leads, or surrender leads to serenity. So the question I want us to wrestle with today is what is your next step? What is God calling you to? Because if God calls you to it, he will see you through it. And if you rationalize and analyze and try to figure out the how, you will never take a step forward and you'll stay stuck. So what is your next step? What has the Holy Spirit been nudging you to do in your life? Maybe for some of you, the Holy Spirit has been nudging you to become a Christian. I love how at Woodland Church, you can be an agnostic, you can be an atheist, and you are welcome here. You are welcome here. This is a safe place for you to figure out and explore who Jesus is, and there will be no manipulative pressure, not for me. So you're safe, you're safe. No arm twisting, but you're not safe from God. <laughs> he will sniff you out, and he will love you, and he will hound you until you come into a saving relationship with him. So if the Holy Spirit's been nudging you that way, you will have anxiety until you take that step. Stop worrying about how. How can I take this step? How will my life change? Just focus on the who. God wants you and loves you with an everlasting love. And if you want peace, surrender to that. Maybe your next step is baptism. You're scared to death to get baptized in a large crowd like this. You're afraid your mascara will run and snot will come out of your nose and on camera and it's live streamed. Get over yourself. Get over yourself. Our next baptism is January 29th. Maybe that's your next step of faith. And if you surrender to it, you'll experience serenity. Surrender leads to serenity. 
Maybe your next step is, is you feel alone. Uh, you don't like people all that much, but you know you want to grow spiritually, and you take a hot coal out of the fire, and it gets cold, but you got to stay connected to other hot coals, and that's what we call grow groups. Maybe your next step is getting in a group that gathers around the Word of God in prayer. Surrender to it. Maybe your next step is serving. You just heard Pastor Thane mention that we have a need for people to help with kids' men. We have over 100 kids every Sunday, Christmas Eve. I don't know how many we'll have. And God has been nudging you to use your gifts with kids to serve him. And you have anxiety about it because you're thinking, of how can I manage this? I don't have that much energy left. Focus on the who is calling you. If God calls you to it, he will see you through it. Surrender leads to serenity. Maybe for you, the next step is reconciliation with someone you're alienated from. And God is saying reconcile by saying, I love you, or I forgive you, or I'm sorry. Maybe your next step that God is nudging you toward, that he wants you to surrender to, is getting some help for your addiction. You're trying to go it alone. You will not make it. Maybe your next step is something else. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's patching things up. Uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's changing careers so you have more time to serve God. Maybe it's going back to school. I don't know. All I know is this, just from experience. When God favors you by calling you to take that next step, if you don't take it because you're focused on the how, you'll have anxiety. You will. If you focus on the who and you surrender to God, you will experience serenity from God. And that will be enough. You don't have to walk around like Atlas with the weight of the world on your shoulders. Place your world in the nail-scarred hands of Jesus Christ. He's big enough to hold not just your world, but the whole world. I love what Andrew Murray says. God is uh, fully capable to... Uh, hold in, to, full, God is ready to assume full responsibility for the life wholly yielded to him. Wholly yielded to him. So if you yield your life to him, he can hold it up. Are you ready to take that next step? Are you ready to say with Mary, I'm the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. Or are you able to say with Jesus, who yielded his life to the Father on the cross, Father, into your hands, hands. I commit my spirit. I want to pray for those of you who just are sensing even now in this moment the Holy Spirit has been nudging you, not just this morning, but maybe for weeks, maybe for years, nudging you to take a step that will require faith in who he is, if not any confidence in who you are, or how you can get it done. So if that's you, if you sense a next step, would you stand up? I want to pray for you. Just stand up. If you, if you sense a next step in your life, something God's been nudging you to do, whether it's become a Christian, whether it's uh, join a group, get baptized, serve in a ministry, reconcile with someone you're alienated from, give a generous gift to someone in need, change careers, go back to school, whatever. If that's you and you just need some courage, stand up. I'm going to pray for you. Thank you. Thanks. Let's pray. Father, for these brothers and sisters who've stood, we pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to nudge them, help them to have the grace, the capacity to see past the how to the who, that they would experience the sweet serenity that comes from surrender to a God who will not let them go. God, I pray that as they step into your will, they would experience peace that surpasses all understanding that would guard their hearts and their minds in Christ. In the name of Christ, the Prince of Peace, we pray. And the people of God said, amen. Let's stand together.